Blue Louse people, this is Dave of Louse Farms Homestead. I'm at the house in town right now, I'm in the office. Um, we're going to be going through the preparedness workshop, uh, Prepping Basics Part 2. Um, much like with the other video, um, if you find this helpful, please share it out. Um, please like and subscribe if you like what you're seeing. Um, also, this is part two in a series that I'm working on, so stay tuned for the rest of whatever's coming up next. Um, today, uh, basics part two. We're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about the basics of your emergency plans and how to make a plan that is specific to your family and your needs. So. Uh, yeah, let's just get right into it. All right, so the first thing that you're gonna to need to do in order to set up an emergency plan that's gonna work for you is to do a risk assessment. So in order to do a risk assessment, you're gonna to have to uh, do a, um, an area study. Is, um, it's called an area study, and what it is is just looking around your area and seeing uh, different aspects of, um, like for instance, environment, infrastructure, um, people, social groups, social things that are happening, um, the economic status and the political status of the area that you live in. These are the main four things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, there is a website, um, it's called the Forward Observer. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the website's called but there's a guy, his name is Sam Culper, he gets really, really deep into the area study and how exactly to do like a, a very in-depth area study. Well, I'm just talking about doing a risk assessment, so this is a little bit different. I mean, it's the same thing, but this is basic compared to what he does. So anyways, so um, pretty much what we're going to do is we're going to look at the things that are going on in the area that you live in and apply those things to how you're going to prepare because like just as a for instance okay um, if you live in uh, Arkansas obviously you're not going to prepare for a hurricane you know like that so um, what this will do is this will tell you your risks the, what risks are to you you and your family in the area that you're in and it'll help you to decide what you need to prepare for and how you need to prepare for it so this will help you to establish an emergency plan that'll work for you and your family in order to create a risk assessment you'll need to do a bit of research on the area you live in important things to research are environment infrastructure people and social groups, and the economic and political state of the area you live in. Right, so when looking at environment, you're going to want to look at terrain, uh, weather patterns, roads and access, and population centers. This is going to be a big deal. These things right here are all going to affect your environment for your risk assessment. When looking at the terrain surrounding your location, it'll be more than flat lands or mountains. You want to consider hills that may cause a landslide and heavy rains and rough terrain that you may need to traverse if you're forced to bug out on foot. Look at the surrounding terrain and note any lakes or rivers. These may be obstacles if you're on foot. Note all major cities in the area and roads surrounding them. Make note of any features that may be cause for concern and why. When looking at weather patterns, you'll be looking at more than heavy snow in winter or tornado season if you live in an affected area. You'll want to have current information for when the weather is predicted to go bad. I suggest listening to your local forecast every morning on the radio. If they're predicting bad weather, monitor it, monitor it more closely. I also suggest that you visit your local weather monitoring website and sign up for weather alerts to your phone or email. 
When looking at the surrounding roads, you'll want to look for bottlenecks or two-lane roads with very few passing lanes that may cause traffic jams. Also look for junctions or bridges that may get blocked. These should be noted as possible trouble areas or choke points when attempting to bug out in a vehicle. Look for roads that run adjacent to main highways and back roads that are less traveled. Also, look for railroad tracks that run adjacent to main highways. When looking at population centers, you'll want to note the largest cities in your area and areas that have a concentrated population. These are areas to avoid at all costs during an emergency. If you're in a large city, you'll want to note several ways to get out. If a large-scale disaster happens, many people will be trying to get out of the city all at once. You'll want to get away from the city as soon as possible after an event. And less traveled roads will be a better option than the main highways. When looking at infrastructure um, in your area, you're going to want to look at bridges and buildings, factories, power plants and dams and you're going to want to look at the local utilities in your area so these are going to matter for for your infrastructure when you're looking at infrastructure in your area for your risk assessment you should take note of any bridges or buildings that may be dangerous in or after an earthquake these will be places to avoid unless it's necessary to be there you never know when an earthquake or other disaster may happen, and you don't want to be inside of a tall building or on a long bridge during a major event. These will also be places to avoid after any major disaster, as their structural integrity may be compromised. You should locate any mines or factories in your area and note what products each one mines or produces. Mines and factories that produce toxic products should be noted as possible sources of emergencies as well as places to avoid in an emergency situation. Some factories have their emergency plans posted on their websites. It may be a good idea to visit their websites and download their emergency plans. This way, you will know what their response will be and you can work their plans into your own emergency plan. If an emergency happens in your area and a power plant is affected, it may cause an extended power outage. Any power plants in the area should be noted, especially nuclear power plants as these can be very dangerous in an emergency event. All of these will be places to avoid in an emergency situation. Any dams in the vicinity should be noted, as well as the likely spillways, in case of a dam failure. This information should be available on the official dam website. Note if you are in the spillway as well as any areas near you that would be affected in a dam failure such as roads out of the area or mines and factories that may spill toxic chemicals if flooded. In an emergency situation the power may go out and all public utilities will stop. If the power is off for an extended amount of time, water and sewage treatment plants may go offline causing the flow of clean water to stop and sewage to back up. Any water or sewage treatment plants in your area should be noted. These two will be places to avoid in an emergency situation. So when you're looking at uh, people and the social situation in your area, you're going to want to look at your group and family. You're going to want to look at local groups, um, gangs and police in the area, and the military, if you have any bases or military installations in your area. That's all going to be a part of your uh, social and people for your risk assessment. Make sure everyone in your group or family knows the plan, knows where to meet, and knows the contingent plans. Have a list of all the people who are in your family or group. You will want to note the locations of everyone in your group who does not reside at your location and the agreed meeting places where you will meet up with those people in an emergency. These locations may need to be moved based on updated information. Once everyone is present, do a head count to verify. It is a good idea to know where certain groups of people are located in the community such as Amish or Mennonite communities or church groups. These are good people to get to know in your community as they will be more willing to help others in an emergency situation. 
Also, the Amish and Mennonites are well prepared for emergencies. Likewise, it's good to know where the bad people are in your area. These will be places to avoid in an emergency situation. If you live in an area where there are gangs, and this includes biker gangs, it is good to know the areas that they control. In an emergency, these gangs will likely try to take advantage of the chaos and perpetrate crimes on the local populace. Any areas that are controlled by gangs are areas to avoid in an emergency situation. It's a good idea to be in contact with your local law enforcement. In the case of an emergency, they may be overwhelmed. You may not be able to count on them for assistance. If you have an emergency plan and the local police are aware, they may be able to assist if they are not overwhelmed. If you live near a military installation, you will want to know where the bases and auxiliaries are located. In an emergency situation, the state or federal government may instate martial law. If this happens, you will not be able to enter or leave the area. Roads will be blocked off and armed military will control the perimeter. I suggest monitoring the situation and doing your best to stay as long as possible, but leave the area before it's locked down. And uh, lastly, on your risk assessment for economic and political, you're going to want to look at uh, economic and political situations locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And this all will affect your economic and political risk assessment for your area and your situation. If your local economy is based on an industry that depends on a specific resource, you will want to monitor the availability of that resource and what will happen in an emergency. If you're in an area that depends on farming and agricultural, you can monitor how things are going in that sector. You should be current on local economy at all times. Much like the local economy, you should be monitoring the economy on a regional level. If you live in a state that depends on good weather for crops and there's a drought, you will want to know that your state is struggling financially to recover from the drought. Also, there will be water issues and wildfires. These events will affect you in one way or another. Often, when there is a disaster in one area of the country, the effects are felt nationwide. It's important to know what is happening on a national level as well. If a disaster happens in a neighboring state, you can expect that refugees from the disaster will be moving into your area. These people may be desperate and hungry. Desperate and hungry people can be very dangerous. You should monitor the happenings of the world. Internationally, when things happen, oftentimes they can affect you. When wars break out in other countries, oftentimes it can affect the economy here. Fuel prices can get inflated, supply chains can be disrupted. I suggest monitoring the situation so that when you see things happening, you will know how to act in order to lessen the impact of these things. Right, so once you've done your area study and you know the things that you need to be looking out for, it's not enough to have those things identified. You need to um, monitor those things. And the best way to monitor them is with information. Now, uh, in the military, they call it intelligence. And we're just going to go with that. So, intelligence. And this is basically information on the things that your risk assessment includes. So, you're going to be monitoring that stuff. And then there's two types of intelligence. You have actionable intelligence and non-actionable intelligence. And uh, I'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, actionable and, and non-actionable. In order to make intelligent decisions as to the course of action, it's very important to have good information. The difference between actionable and non-actionable intelligence is as follows. Actionable intelligence is verified or verifiable information that is relevant to the current situation and that directly or indirectly affects the outcome of a decision. Verified means that the information has been researched and has been found to be accurate. 
verifiable means that it can be verified once and once verified can be used as actionable intelligence. Directly means that it affects you at once in a direct way, like there's nothing between it and you. Indirectly means that it will affect you eventually, after it affects whatever is between you and it. Non-actionable intelligence is information that is either not relevant to the current situation or that cannot be verified. Often this comes in the form of gossip or rumors and hearsay. If the information does not affect you or your situation, you should not use it as intelligence. Perhaps it may be something to monitor and keep tabs on, but it should not be included in your intelligence until it becomes relevant. Be careful that it will not affect you indirectly. Some things should be included that do not seem immediately relevant, but that may affect you indirectly. For instance, a food shortage may not affect you directly because you have food stored and can survive for six weeks without going to the grocery store. However, when the stores run out of food, those who have not prepared will be hungry and looking for food. Hungry, desperate people can become violent, and when they start to riot in the streets, this will affect you directly. So the next thing, when you're getting your intelligence, um, actionable and non-actionable intelligence, you have to look at your sources, okay? So where you're getting your information from is important. And then you can arrange it into reports or um, however you want to handle the uh, intel when it comes in so these are important you want to make sure that you're monitoring all of your situations and you want to make sure that you're sorting and filing and keeping track of all of this information you need to monitor all of this there are many sources for information these days with the internet and social media you should be very careful about where you get your information from and most important, never take another person's word for anything unless you know them well and you know for sure that you can trust their word. Some sources of information may be news, television, news radio, newspapers, YouTube channels, social media, or word of mouth. Remember to be careful of what you take as information and always verify information through a trusted source. The most important part of intelligence gathering is the information. This is what's called an intelligence report. This can be anything from a sheet of paper with notes written down from news reports throughout the week to a full report in an official format. Just depends on how much time and effort you want to put into it. Each week this information can be verified and then applied to your risk assessment. As situations arise in your area, you'll be able to follow their development and adjust your risk assessment accordingly. All right, so once you've got your risk assessment figured out and you know what all of your factors are and you have your intelligence and you're monitoring the situation, this should all work into your um, emergency plan. And your emergency plan should include a bug out location, possibly two. I would suggest at least two, possibly three. But I mean, I'm, that's, this is for basic even in your basic you should have a bug out location now whether that's a, a friend's house or family's house or a vacation property it could even be a hotel you know as long as you have a place that you're planning to go in the case that something happens you should have a bug out location now once you have all of this stuff together and you have your bug out location set up in your emergency plan and we'll go through the emergency plan in a lot more detail in the next in part three we'll go through all of that right now we're just seeing what to prepare for and why that's what this is about so basics part two we're talking about what to prepare for and why and then monitoring it and all of that so then we'll talk about developing an emergency plan in the next one so once you have all of this in order and you know what your risks are and what your situations are and you're monitoring everything the next thing that you should do is make a chart like this for your indicators. See, these are your indicators right here, and this is going to tell you when it's time to bug out, when it's time to leave. This will tell you. So this one is based on just a uh, quick uh, 
like uh, some possibly in California. So their indicators are an earthquake might get them to leave, a wildfire, a blackout, uh, job loss, food scarcity. Maybe they're a little concerned about food scarcity. Okay, and the the factors that are going to affect these things are the environment is going to affect your earthquake and your wildfire, possibly your blackout, which may lead to a job loss or food scarcity. It's all possible. Food. This is going to be the you know your food food loss or sorry food scarcity. Um, infrastructure. If something happens here, it could lend to a blackout or a job loss or food scarcity. Um, people. So people could be a threat in the in the event of a really bad earthquake or a wildfire or a blackout or food scarcity. People could become an issue. Um, eco, uh, economical and political issues could cause uh, job loss or food scarcity and contribute to problems. So um, what you would do is you'd be watching things and you know. Uh, say for instance, uh, you know, environment has two, two thing, you know, that just kind of chalk it down, you know, these things could affect that, you know what I'm saying? And just kind of go down the line. There may be food, and the reason we're doing this is because these, this, as as we're watching this, okay, say there's an earthquake has happened, you know, and maybe they're expecting another one, and it's, you know, contributing to this, there's been a wildfire, you know, um, you're expecting blackouts, whatever, it hasn't happened yet, this stuff hasn't happened yet, food, you can see that the prices are going up, maybe that's a, a tick here, not on this one, that would be down here, you know, maybe prices are going up, and there's less on the shelves, you know, uh, maybe, you know, however, you know, and you just start filling it in and put your marks in there for wherever, you know, things are going to affect things and as they start to add up and then you got your totals here, you know, so you got a total here and these total up and total out and out here at the bottom, you know, when you get to a certain number, whatever that number looks like for you, that's when it's time for you to leave. You see what I'm saying? So you just check all of these things and keep track of it. And once it gets to the indicators get to a point where it's no longer safe to be in your home, that's when you leave. Now, let me make this very clear. Uh, from the beginning, okay, and we'll talk about this again in part three when we go through the uh, um, the uh, emergency plans, okay? Your number one plan, default, should always be to bug in. Shelter in place should always be your first choice. That's where all of your stuff is, that's where all of your food is, that's where all of your comforts are, your security, everything. So it's your last option to leave that place. You don't leave until there's there are a few things. So let's see things that would cause you to leave your home. Okay, um, if it's no longer safe to be there, um, like a fire, um, a gas leak, uh, if if the sewage stops and backs up and you have sewage coming into your house. Um, a, a violence. If there's violence in the streets outside of your house, if you got rioters beating on your front door, you probably don't want to be there. Um, uh, or, you know, whatever, maybe, I don't know. Uh, do not leave your house until it is unsafe to stay there. So, but the, the intent of this is to predict it ahead of time so that, like, for instance, if, if okay, so if there's an earthquake or a wildfire, right, that uh, destroys the infrastructure, causes a blackout, right? Now there's a blackout. There hasn't been 
electricity in two weeks okay so after two weeks now nobody's been working so your jobs are lost all the food's gone out of the stores right so here you're all the way down on this one so there's no food in the stores anymore right so now people are starting to get crazy and then you got your um, economic and political stuff going on you know maybe the military's coming out trying to keep control of stuff and you got things going all crazy and then you got people coming in trying to kick down your door looking for food you know once any of this stuff starts to happen when you see people in here people at food scarcity right here right when it starts getting violent in the streets a mile away from your house two miles three miles because you got your intelligence right you start hearing about this from your sources start telling you that actionable intelligence that there are people rioting two miles from your house and they're heading in towards your neighborhoods looking for food that's when it's time to pack everything up and leave so that's how this is supposed to work these are just indicators based on information that will help you to uh, leave before it's too late so because you don't want to leave too soon if you leave too soon you leave your house and then you're at your bug out place and you know you left everything in your house and and it was too soon and you didn't need to you know and this this will help you to decide when it's time to leave all right so anyways um i will get you guys a picture of this and i'll put it at the end of the video so you can pause it and take notes if you want to or whatever and uh yeah, I'm going to wrap it up for right now. Um, stay tuned for the next one. Next time we're going to do part three, and that's going to be your um, preparedness plan, your emergency plan. So we're going to go through all of that. Now, once more, if you found this video uh, uh, educational, helpful, uh, whatever you want to call it, if you thought it was helpful, please share it out to other people. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks.